This morning, we're going to talk about something that um, is a very uh, dear to my heart and something that we as a people should be preparing for, and that is preparing for, for the latter rain. There is an acronym that I, I use many often times called study, study to understand doctrine your, yourself. And here in this slide says, in the balance of the sanctuary, the Seventh Adams Church is to be weighed. It says she will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ at infinite cost has bestowed on her, if the blessing com conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, here's an interesting uh, comment, on her will be pronounced the sentence found wanting. And she says, by the light bestowed, the opportunities given, will she be judged? So we're going to be judged by the opportunities, by the experiences that we've had, experiences that we should have. So interesting the uh, expression weighed in the balances says if god has already decided that the church as many are telling the ship is going through as many believe then why would god's inspired messenger tell us that it must first go to where to judgment why would she tell us that the judge could pronounce the church wanting this to me makes absolutely no sense if it's already been determined that the church is going through to the to the heavenly kingdom so if the church were found wanting by the heavenly judge, Christ himself, how much hope would there be for it is the question I ask you to ask yourself. Know that these words weighed and, and found are found in Daniel chapter 5, verse 27, when the heavenly judge declared that Belshazzar's kingdom was weighed and the balances and found wanting. How much hope was there for Belshazzar's kingdom there in Babylon? The takeaway here is that this is no time to be at ease in Zion. This is no time for preaching peace and safety. For example, everybody just stay in the boat. You'll be safe. The ship is, is going to go through. In the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh Avenue Church is to be weighed. She will be judged. Again, I ask you to, to think about that. Before the destruction of Sodom, God sent a message to Lot. Escape for thy life. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. The same voice of warning was heard by the disciples of Christ. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. There was a, what was there? A coming out, a decided separation from the wicked, an escape for life. So it was in the days of Noah, so with Lot, so with the disciples prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, and so it will be when. Are we not living in the last days? Again, the voice of God is heard in the message of warning, bidding his people separate themselves from the prevailing iniquity. Many souls will come from where? Other denominational churches. And at the 11th hour will obey what? They're going to obey all the truth because they have not set themselves in array against heaven's light, but lived up to all the light they had. While those who have had great light, like you and I, large privileges and opportunities and have failed to live in the light and walk in the light, what's going to happen? Will drop out by the way. Their light will shine less and less. That's what we're told in Matthew 5. We're, you know, we're told, let your light so shine. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed in a scared of assembling ourselves together much more in the latter day as the day approaches says, for the want of the oil of grace in their vessels with their lamps. So, in heavenly places, if you are right with God, when? Today, you are ready to ready if Christ should come, when? Today. If you're right with him today, you will be ready if Christ was to come today. So, we're going to be looking at the coming oil crisis. Yes, right now, many may be thinking the high price is there in California for gas and all that, but there's going to be a higher price to pay if we miss out in the actual oil that is wanting to be poured out upon us, the Holy Spirit. Let's look at a couple of the things, the signs of the times. There's going to be a false revival. I believe that this has been going on for several years, but it's going to intensify more. It says a little time before the loud cry, Satan will arouse a false excitement within where? every church which will unify them in their attainment to their goal early writers were told in 261 
says, I saw that God has on his children among who? The normal Adventists and the fallen churches. And when? Before the plague shall be poured out. Ministers and people, what's going to happen? Will be called out from these churches. And what's going to happen? They will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this. And, and before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected, what well, have they rejected? The truth may think that God is with them. So we can see the evidence of it in the expansion of false revival moving greatly. In great controversy, we're told in 464, before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since when? Apostolic times. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And when? Before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing what? A counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be a what? Great religious interest. And you, if you're watching the news, you know, the fake news or whatever, you're hearing more of religion, more things being talked about on Fox News and things that those places that you've ever heard before in the last several years says there is an emotional excitement, a mingling of the true with the false that is well adapted to mislead. Yet we're told none need be deceived. In the light of what? God's word. See, that's the key right there is to help us understand that we've got to get into the word of God. It is not difficult to determine the nature of these movements. Wherever men neglect the testimony of the Bible, Turning away from those plain soul testing truths, which require what's going to require self denial, meaning if the Holy Spirit's waking you up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, that's going to require self denial. Yes, it'd be nice to have another two or three hours more sleep, but it's getting up and studying the Word of God, praying, and all it's going to require that self denial and renunciation of the world. There we may be sure that God's blessing is not bestowed. There's going to take much sacrifice. Every decision, my brothers and sisters, that you are making is going to cost you. Either it's going to cost you in this life, the comforts, the ease and everything else, the persecution, the belittlement of your family and friends. I mean, here at Pioneer, there's individuals that are moving to the country and they're getting harassed, persecuted by their own children. They're saying, you know, if you hadn't gone to that church, you wouldn't be looking to uh, move out into the country and all that. They're blaming me. And that's okay, you know. But every decision is going to cost you this world or is it going to cost you eternity? This is a serious question that we must all ask ourselves. There's going to be false prophets that's going to be appearing. Matthew 24, 11 says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall, what's gonna, they're going to do? Deceive many. Matthew 7, 15 to 20, we're told, Beware of false prophets which come to you in how sheep's clothing but inwardly they are waving wolves you shall know them how by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles even so every good tree bringeth forth what good fruit every good you know a uh, disciple of christ is going to bring good uh, bring forth good fruit but a crook tree bringeth forth evil fruits that's why this morning before you left home, did you get on your hands and knees or did you sit in your car and bow your head and ask, dear God, I ask for protection as I go to church, protect my family, my church family, protect our church that there will be not people that will cause problems or bring in false teachings and everything else or, or cause mischief. This is a serious time that we're living in. We must earnestly pray for that. It says every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you will know them. It says many false prophets come into churches thinking that they are teaching truths, but are really bringing division that breaks up the church slowly but surely. We must be aware of this and keep on our watch. 
in Acts chapter 20, we're told, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. We are to care for others as well, over whom the, uh, whom the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he, he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking where they're going to be speaking, perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And this is what the devil will constantly do there at the Colton church. That he's going to bring in people that's going to try to divide and break and, and have people fall after them. We need to be falling after Christ. And if we fall after Christ, there's going to be unity because we're basing our life on the truth. And how is this being done right now? Well, through unsanctified ministers that are preaching error, books of a new order will be published in falsifying of the testimonies. Second Peter, we're told, but there were false prophets also among the people. Peter experienced that he saw this. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bringing upon themselves what that's going to happen, swift destruction, correct? And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through how they're going to do covetousness. They will covet you to follow after them through covetousness shall they with theme wonderful words eloquent words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not but we're told uh, in warning and testimonies here um sorry flipped on the wrong one Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers were told unsanctified ministers are arraying themselves against who God, they are praising Christ and the God of this world in the same breath. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from where? The hellish torch of Satan. If doubts and unbelief are cherished, the faithful ministers will be removed from the people who think they know so much. If thou hast known, we're told, by Christ, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from where? From our eyes. That's why Paul, writing to Timothy, told us, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in when? Latter times. Are we in the latter times, brothers and sisters? Yes. That some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies how? in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's why, because iniquity or lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. What's interesting is when wax is hot, you can work with it, can't you? It is moldable, you know, that you can mold into something. But when it becomes cold, it hardens up, and then you are unable to uh, mold it into candles and many other things. It is the same with the Christian. When we are hot for the truth and willing for the master designer to mold us into his character, we are, what are we? We are workable. But when we are cold, then there is nothing that can be done for us and not we're not able to be formed into Christ's image. So this verse here mentioned is not referring to those that do not know the truth, but rather to those that are in the very heart of the professed church, okay? Diffusing its chilling influence through the whole body. As a result, the love of many has grown cold. Second Timothy, we're told, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, femers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, haiti, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than what? Lovers of God, having a 
form of godliness, but what are they doing? Denying the power thereof. What are we supposed to do from such? Turn away. You know, we're, we're approaching Easter weekend. This is a decision you're going to have to make, the decision here at my church as well, that are they going to succumb to the Easter sunrise service that's being done here at Southern? Or are we supposed to have no fellowship with the unfruitful uh, works of darkness? These are decisions that we have to make now, because if we don't make those decisions now, it's going to be harder for us to make those decisions later to stand up for truth. So let us not have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, we're told, from such we're to turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. They are ever learning and never, never able to do what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. This is sad, very sad. Darkness before dawn, we're told these persons overlook the testimony of the scriptures concerning the wonders wrought by Satan and his agents. It was by satanic aid that Pharaoh's magicians were enabled to counterfeit the work of God. Paul testifies that before, listen, before the second advent of Christ, there will be similar manifestations of satanic power, brothers and sisters. The coming of the Lord is to proceed, uh, is to be preceded by the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians were told the Apostle John describing the miracle working power that will be manifest manifested in these last days declares he doeth great wonders so that he maketh what fire come down. This is why. A couple of years ago, Kenneth Copeland was predicting he's, they're going to call fire down from heaven. So he's going to, here in these last days, they will be able to do that to deceive them that dwell in the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. No mere imposters are here foretold. Men are deceived by the miracles which Satan's agents have power to do, not which they pretend to do. So this is, we have to be rooted and grounded in the truth to be able to discern the de deceptions that Satan are try is trying to allure you into so you can give up the faith once given to the saints. Music is also made a snare. In Selective Messages, Volume 2, we're told, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me. So we've got to pay attention when Ellen White writes, the Lord has shown me would take place when just before the close of probation every uncouth thing will be demonstrated there will be what's going to happen shouting with drums music and dancing the senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make what right decisions a bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which if conducted aright might be a blessing the powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival. And this then is termed the Holy Spirit's work. And wow, they put that charge on the Holy Spirit. Those things which have been in the past, she says, will be when? In the future. Are we not in the future right now? Yes. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. That's why we got to be careful with our music, not only in our church, but also what we listen to. Going on, Selected Messages says, Let us give no place to strange exercisings, which really take the mind away from the deep movings of the Holy Spirit. Do you come today to listen for the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction in your life of sin and of righteousness. That's why we've come. We've come to worship God so that when we leave, we are in a closer relationship and walk with Christ. God's work is ever characterized by calmness and dignity as well. Not this bedlam and noise, shouting and screaming and all that. False tongue speaking is also going to be made a snare. Testimony volume one, we're told fanaticism. And we've got to be very careful fanaticism because we're told it's almost impossible to get individuals out of these fanatic fanaticism. 
false excitement, false talking in tongues, and noisy exercises have been considered gifts which God has placed in the church. Some have been deceived here. The fruits of all this have what? Not been good. Excuse me. Ye shall know them how? By their fruits. Fanaticism and noise have been considered special evidences of faith. Some are not satisfied with a meeting unless they have a powerful and happy time. They come for the wrong thing. They work for this and get up an excitement of feeling. Are we to, supposed to rely on feeling? By the influence of such meetings is not beneficial. When the happy flight of feeling is gone, what happens? And that's what I talk about. These they come, people come for spiritual highs. And if they don't get the high today in, in church, then they sink lower, don't they? Than before the meeting, because their happiness did not come from the right source. The most profitable meetings for spiritual advance, advancement are those which are characterized with solemnity and deep searching of what? Your heart. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to search your heart? Try me, improve me, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Each seeking to know himself and earnestly and in deep humility seeking to learn of Christ. We're also going to be dealing with and experiencing evil angels appearing as false human beings. Early writings were told, I saw that the saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth. That's the key. Do we want present truth or pleasant truth? which they will be obliged to maintain from the scriptures. They must understand, she tells us, the state of the dead. For the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, not just people not of Adventism, but they will appear to us, professing to be beloved friends and relatives, brothers and sisters, who will declare to them that, here's the key, that the Sabbath has been changed. Also, other unscriptural doctrines they will be claiming. They will do all in their power to excite sympathy. And this is why I encourage you. I hope you're taking notes. I hope that you will go and study about what we're told about sympathy. We've got to be careful in who and what we sympathize with. And will work miracles before them to confirm what they declare as well. The Garverse, he says, through the two great heirs, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under how? His deceptions. In 2 Corinthians, we're told, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And we're told, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. Tolan Manuscript says, Satan will use every opportunity to seduce men from their allegiance to God. He and the angels who fell with him will appear on the earth as men. So we're told the warning. We're told that they will appear as, as men here on this earth, seeking to deceive God's angels also will, will appear as men and will use every means in their power to defeat the purpose of the enemy. Thank God for that. Though we are given a warning saying his angels are going to appear to try to uh, falsify things, but God will also his, send his angel to also use their power, what they're allowed to, to, to defeat the purposes of Satan. Selected messages were told evil angels in the form of men will talk with those who listen. This is a warning for you and for me. Evil angels in the form of men will talk with those who know the truth. They will min misinterpret and misconstrue the statements of the messengers of God. Have, she says, Seventh-day Adventists forgotten the warning given in the sixth chapter of Ephesians? We are engaged in a warfare against the host of darkness unless we follow our leader how? Closely. Satan will, be, will obtain the victory over us if we're not 
following our leader very closely. Mind, character, and personality. We're told evil angels in the form of believers will work in our ranks to bring in a strong spirit of unbelief. So as if the, potentially that Alan Wyatt and some of the pioneers of, of our Adventist church may appear, it's not uh, unthinkable here. Let not even this discourage you, but bring a true heart to the help of the Lord against the powers of satanic agencies. These powers of evil will assemble where? Look, look, listen. These powers of evil will assemble in our meetings, not to receive a blessing, but to counterwork the influences of the Spirit of God. So they will come to try to undo what the present truth is being presented so there's going to be a personation of the dead in evangelism we're told it is not difficult for the evil angels to represent both saints and sinners who have died to make these representations visible to who human eyes these manifestations will be listen more frequent and developments of a more startling character will appear as we near what the close of time. So it's going to be more frequent. It's going to be more startling in character. Signs of the time, we're told, it is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion. One calculated to take hold of what? Remember I told you to look up and study about this. Of uh, The sympathies of those who have laid their loved ones in the grave. Evil angels come in the form of those loved ones and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. In this way, they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. These evil angels who assume to be the deceased friends are regarded with a certain idolatry and with many their word has greater weight than the word of god that's why we've got to know the truth about the state of the dead because otherwise our sympathies yes we may grieve we may you know because of our loss of a loved one or what have you but we've got to know what the word of god says about when they have passed away very controversy we're told he satan has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends the counterfeit is what perfect the familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many will be confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives or friends and declaring the most dangerous, what are they going to be declaring? The most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appear to our, I'm sorry, will appeal to our tenderest sympathies. There's that word again, sympathies and will work miracles to sustain, sustain their pretensions. So this is why we've got to be careful about our sympathies as well. Christ, nearing the close of his earthly ministry before offering himself as a sacrificial lamb, he instructs his disciples regarding the most essential and complete gift that he would bestow upon his followers. So in our day, before the work in the most holy place is to be completed, Christ will bestow upon his followers the most essential and complete gift. But, listen, a correct biblical and spirit of prophecy understanding and belief of this gift, the preparation of the, for this gift, the purpose of this gift, and the nature of this gift will depend on if it is to be given to us and if it will be received by us. Do you understand? This is why I'm going to take a little time here before we get into our part two in our divine service. Counsels to parents, teachers, and students. We're told those who seek the education that the world esteems so highly are gradually led, how? Further and further from the principles of what? Truth. Why are we seeking the worldly, uh, world for accreditations and for wisdoms and everything else? We need to go to the word of God, the spirit of prophecy. At what a price have they gained their education? They have parted with who? The Holy Spirit of God. 
they have chosen to accept what the world calls knowledge in the place of the truths which God has committed to men through, listen, his ministers and apostles and prophets. God has given us this information by those who have been sanctified by obeying the truth. That's why there is a movement of uh, uh, spiritualistic beliefs within our Adventist church. Special testimonies were told, I am instructed. Remember, if I was shown or I was instructed, pay attention, brothers and sisters. I am instructed to say the sentiments of those who are searching for what? Advanced scientific ideas are what? Not to be trusted. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Those who are it's searching for advanced scientific ideas are not to be trusted. Such representations as the following are made. So listen closely what she enumerates. The father is as the light invisible. The son is as the light embodied. The spirit is the light shed abroad. Or she says the father is like the dew, invisible vapor. The sun is like the dew gathered in beauteous form. The spirit is like the dew fallen to the seed of life. Another, she says, the father is like the invisible vapor. The sun is like the leaden cloud. The spirit is rain fallen and working in refreshing power. We've got to be careful how we can we attribute these, these characteristics to the Godhead. That's why we've got to uh, see what she defines as the Godhead, and we need to stop using the word Trinity. Going on in special uh, testimony, it says all these spiritualistic representations that we just read are simply nothingness. They are imperfect, untrue. They weaken, listen, and diminish the majesty which no earthly likeness can be compared to. So quit comparing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost by earthly things. God cannot be compared with the things his hands have made. These are merely earthly things, suffering under the curse of God because of the sins of who? Of man. The Father cannot be described by the things of earth. Now, this is not in the original, the number one, so this is what I've, I've added. Number one, the Father is all the fullness of what? The Trinity. Is that what she said? No. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. Number two, the Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. The Word of God declares him to be the express image of his person. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him in him should what not perish but have everlasting life here is shown the personality of who the father the comforter number three that christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of what the godhead making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as how? A personal Savior. Do you believe Christ as a personal Savior? There are, she says, three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ, how? by living faith are baptized and these powers will cooperate with the obedient again we got to be obedient subjects of heaven in the effort to live the new life in christ so let's look at the son of god here the pre-existent self-existent son of god and signs of the times were told christ is the pre-existent self-existent meaning that the Father is not necessary for the Son to exist. The Holy Spirit is not necessary for the Son to exist. They all can exist without the need or aid of the others. In speaking of his preexistence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time 
when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. He, to whose voice the Jews were then listening, had been with God as what? One brought up with him. So he had, had always existed. Look at this quote here, man, manuscript 101. He was, talking about Christ, equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal, self-existent son. Look at this review in here, quote, from everlasting, while God's Word speaks of the humanity of Christ when upon this earth. It also speaks decidedly regarding his, what, pre-existence. The word existed as a divine being, even as the eternal son of God in union and oneness with his father from everlasting. He was the mediator of the covenant, the one in whom all nations of the earth, both Jews and Gentiles, if they accepted him, were to be blessed. The word was with God, and the word was God. Before men or angels were created, the word was with God and was God. Amen. Signs of the time were told. Christ shows them that although they might reckon his life to be less than 50 years, yet his divine life could not be reckoned by human computation. The existence of Christ before his incarnation is not measured, listen, by figures. His preexistence before is not measured by figures or numbers or years. It is our of ages, we're told, in page 530, says, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. Listen closely. She finally defined it after years of argument within the church she writes she says in christ is life original unborrowed under de derived he that hath the son hath what life the divinity of christ is the believer's assurance of what eternal life so let me read that again the divinity of christ is the believer's assurance of eternal if christ was not divine we would not have any assurance historical sketches when they, Israel, came to Sinai, he took occasion to refresh their minds in regard to who? His requirements. He reminded them of his Christ requirements. Christ and the Father standing side by side upon the mount with the solemn majesty proclaimed the Ten Commandments. The Father and the Son proclaimed the Ten Commandments. Manuscript, the eternal heavenly dignitaries, God and Christ, and the Holy Spirit arming them, the disciples, with more than mortal energy, would advance with them to the work and convince the world of sin. So these eternal dignitaries would work in cooperation with those that are willing to be used by them. Personality, look at the Holy Spirit from a talk that was given to the students there in Avondale. It says, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, look how she, she she stops here, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking where? Through these grounds. And I dare say he is walking with us now in divine service as well. First Corinthians, we're told, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the what the spirit does, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but who? The spirit of God. Manuscript, she gives us a little bit uh, a bigger uh, definition, explanation, says, The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, it carries with it its own evidence. At such times, we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has a what? Personality. Else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He couldn't bear witness. He must also be a what? Divine person. Else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. So he is a divine person. This is where, why I'm sharing this with you, because at this time, 
the Holy Spirit is being attacked viciously. Special ten testimonies were told the print of the power of evil can only be held in check by the what? The power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Satan is held in check. This is the work of the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit keeps Satan's power in check if we allow him. Ephesians 4.30, brothers and sisters, is to me a, is a warning to us in these last days. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of what? Redemption. Don't grieve him. Give him his worship. Give him his di divine uh, 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 status. We need to give him that. Otherwise, we're grieving him, not giving him the, the respect and honor that he is due. First Thessalonians were told, quench not what? Don't quench the spirit. The Holy Spirit. Acts 7.51 says, Ye stick net and uncircumcised. This is from Stephen. In heart and ears, ye do always what were they doing? They resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do ye. Do not resist the Holy Spirit. And so we've got to work in cooperation with the three great highest powers. Special Testimonies, again, says we are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven. The Father, the Son, and who? The Holy Ghost. And these powers will work through us, making us workers together with who? With God, brothers and sisters. So consider this. When ministry becomes performance, then the sanctuary becomes what? A theater. I'm not here to perform. We shouldn't come to worship and have some of that is performing. Otherwise, it becomes a theater. The congregation becomes an audience. Worship becomes entertainment. And man's applause and approval become the measure of what? Success. Mm. But when ministry is for the glory of God, when ministry is for the glory of God, his presence moves into where? The sanctuary. Even the unsaved visitor will fall down on his face, worship God, and what is it going to happen to them? Confess that God is among us. Even the unsaved visitor that comes to worship, they will confess and, and know that God has been there. Letter 97 says, May the Lord give no rest day nor night to those who are now careless and indolent in the cause and work of God. The end is near, brothers and sisters. This is that which Jesus would have us keep ever before us. What? The shortness of time. This is to be before us. We don't have much time. We must do what we can now. Ministers should be faithful watchmen, seeing the evil and warning the people. Their dangers must be set before them continually and pressed home upon them. The exhortation given to Timothy was reprove, rebuke, exhort with how? All long suffering and doctrine. We are to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. We must be patient, must be patient. Testimonies to Ministers, page 113 says, when we as a people understand what this book means to us, there will be seen among us a great revival. We do not understand fully the lessons that it teaches, notwithstanding the injunction given us to search and to do what? Study. She's talking about the Bible. We don't understand because we're not studying. We should be studying. We will understand the times and the seasons that we're living in. So look at this a few minutes that we have time. Look at the Trinity doctrine. In order to know what the doctrine of the Trinity is all about, we must have a correct definition of what it means. Both Webster's and Funk and Wagnos Dictionary defines the Trinity as a state or character of being what? Three. Any union of three parts or elements in what? One. A threefold cons uh, consubstantial or sharing the same, this is the key, substance. Personality existing in one divine being or substance, meaning so three sharing the same substance and all that. The union of one God, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three infinite persons and all that, but they're sharing the same source. 
So the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that three infinite persons who all share the same substance makes up one God or one God divided into three parts. It is extremely important that this point is clearly understood. And recently we've been, um, when I presented this here, there was a lady that has been uh, calling us Trinitarians. I'm like, the fact that you're calling me a Trinitarian tells me that you don't even understand what the word Trinity or Trinitarian is. So that's why I put on here is extremely important that this point is clearly understood. Trinity does not mean that there are three gods, but it means that there is only one God which is shared among three persons, brothers and sisters. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity defines God as being one God existing in three co-equal. We're going to look at these words, co-eternal, co-substantial, divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons sharing one homunison uh, um, aspect. So, co consubstantial of the same substance or essence, used especially of the three persons of the Trinity in Christian theology is what, what I found. Homunison uh, is a Christian theological term most low, notably used in the Nicene Creed for describing Jesus as same in being or same in essence with God the Father. The same term was later also applied to the Holy Spirit in order to designate him as being same in essence with the Father and Son. This is from uh, Wikipedia. The terms Father, Son, and Spirit are but symbols which stand for three manifestations of God. God goes forth from himself, listen, in the eternal son, returning to himself in the eternal spirit. This is uh, from the dictionary of all scriptures and myths. Uh, it says this dictionary uses the phil uh, philosophic sacred held writings of all religions, such as Zoroaster, Philo, Swinburne, uh, Buddha, Hermes, and uh, Quabella, et cetera in order to derive its definitions. Hence, the definitions given are what? These definitions are from a mystical, occultic, and spiritualistic in nature. So for me is going to that source as to what the true definition, and this is what is being used within uh, Christian uh, denominations and, and, and Adventism as well. So origins of the uh, word Trinity, the first council of Nicene formed in AD 325 was a group of bishops who were based in what is now we call Turkey. They confirmed the use of the term Trinity, particularly regarding the ideas of God as father and son. The first council of Constantinople confirmed the nature and role of the Holy Spirit in 381 later on. So who believes in the Trinity doctrine? Well, um, who believes in the uh, doctrine of the Trinity of only one God manifested in three beings, sharing the same essence or substance and making up just one God? Well, the Roman Catholics, this is where the origins are. It says, in God, they quote, are three persons, Father and Son and Holy Ghost, equal in all perfections, the converts catechism of Catholic doctrine, uh, page 31. In fact, the Trinity doctrine is the central doctrine of Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the church, which to me is kind of interesting. You know, they, they uh, assert that Mary is a co-matrix, so it's a, a quad, quad doctrine, whatever, a quad idiom, where they actually uh, a lift um, uh, Mother Mary as a co-matrix, co-redeemer, and all that. So, Seventh-day Adventists also teach in the fundamental belief number two, they have the Trinity. They define this as there is one God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. And this is from the 2000 SDA Church Manual. And you can find this also in the, um, the, the 27 front of the release. This is the older one, but it's the same um, similar in the, the, the newer one, of uh, the 28 front of the release as well. Here's another interesting, the World Council of Churches also believe in the Trinity. It says the World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches which confess the, the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the scriptures, and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So much in common, co-authored by who? Seventh-day Adventist Church and the World Councils of Churches co-authored this, this statement. 
The World Council of Churches is made up of various councils or fellowship of churches from around the world who have chosen to join together in this great union. But before any church can seek admittance in the World Council of Churches, it must first embrace what? The Trinity doctrine. So all churches which are connected with the Royal Council of Churches have embraced this Trinity doctrine. And what are the names of some of these churches? Those churches which have connection with the Royal Council of Churches include, but are not limited to, the following Anglican, Armenian, Assemblies of God, Baptist, Brethren, Christian, Church of God, Disciples, Episcopal, Evangelical, Congregational, Evangelical Reform. And as you go down, you'll see where I have highlighted Seventh-day Adventists are also part of this world council and church. And as I conclude with this one, and we take our breaks, as you can see that the vast majority of Christendom are involved in believing this Trinity doctrine. And the Trinity doctrine is the belief that there is only one God, which is shared between three persons. Also remember that the basis for this Trinity belief is not founded where? It's not found in the Bible but is founded in the teachings of spiritualism and the occult. So if you want to be a believer in spiritualistic and occult doctrine, then continue believing that there is only one God who is made up of three persons, brothers and sisters. So we've got to be very, very careful in this. So God bless you all. Shall we have prayer as we conclude our first, first part here? Father in heaven, we thank you again for the truths that you've given us, the warnings that you've given us, because as we are talking about, and as we should be preparing for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, help us, Father, to realize that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, that if we're to receive him, we need to understand and believe what has been given about him. So, Lord, forgive us if we have failed thee. Give us strength. Give us um, courage. Give us boldness to stand for the truth, though the heavens fall. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 